The next presenter will be Dr. Aaron Ann Saffel. Dr. Saffel is the Arizona State Climatologist, Director of the Arizona State Climate Office, and Senior Global Futures Scientist with the Julia Ann Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory. Her main research interests are extreme weather and climate events, including flood and drought, as well as impacts of the urban heat island. She is currently co-chair of the Arizona Drought Monitoring Technical Committee and serves on the American Meteorological Society Board of Outreach and Informal Education. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm going to share screen and uh, let's see if I can get this. Uh, you, This will stop other screen sharing. Do I want to continue? Yes. And one moment. We're going right in. All right, folks. Thanks so much for allowing me to, to talk to you today. I'm thrilled to be able to do so. The ideas that I talk about are relatable. They're what we all experience. And so as the state climatologist, I'm thrilled to be able to share this information, a little bit of the background on what happens, a little bit of the science that, that goes into these ideas. And so we're going to be looking at some issues that are impacted by the climate of Arizona. And so our, our talk is going to be about those specific kinds of issues that really affect health more than anything. And so we're going to be looking at heat and drought and air quality and how our climate affects those kinds of issues. The climate, when we talk about climate, climate is, um, you know, it's not well understood what climate means. What we're looking at really are statistical trends when we're looking at the climate of a location. So that can mean, you know, looking at the, the range of observations, like how hot did it get, how cold did it get? We can look at um, the frequency, like how often do we get frost? Um, and, and all of those kinds of things are built into understanding the climate of, of a location. Quite often though, the, the two main characteristics of climate are temperature, and precipitation. And so you'll see that a lot of our discussion centers on those ideas. So we are gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. And you're gonna see information on how I was trained. So I was born and raised here in Arizona. And my first memory in the very early 1970s when I was probably about three or four was my parents sandbagging our house in Scottsdale. So I was very, very young, but I absolutely recall these, these events. Um, and we lived over by Rural Road, um, Scottsdale Road, the Indian Bend Wash that, that is now a green belt. It's a floodway to prevent flooding events. It wasn't there at the time. And so obviously the flooding event encroached into the, the houses that were surrounding that location. And so I've always been fascinated with water. In Arizona, we have too much or we don't have enough. And that's the nature of living in the Sonoran Desert. That's part of what builds the climate of a desert. So we'll talk about some of those ideas as well. But um, my training is in physical geography. So I was interested in, in studying meteorology and climatology when I was going to university. And in Arizona, we offer those degree programs within the geography department. I had no idea what geography was at the time. I didn't have that concept of, of what physical geography entails. But geographers, what we really do is we look at spatial patterns. So we use maps quite a bit to understand those, those patterns so that we can solve the pattern, we can explain the pattern, we can keep people safe. Um, and so we can solve a lot of very interesting and what are called wicked problems that are really hard to solve because there are so many components going in. And so I, I bring to you an example of how geographers think and what we look at when we're, we're looking at our maps. So we're looking at 2011 tornado watches by county. So this is over the entire year. And you can see that there's a, a focus right in through here um, when we're looking at, um, so there's Arkansas and we're looking at um, Mississippi and Alabama and those locations. And, and um, you can see that there are a lot of watches for tornadoes. A watch is when we put out a heads up. 
it, it says that we have the ingredients coming together that can build a tornado in this example. Um, when we put out watches, again, it's just looking at the ingredients coming together and it's possible. With a warning, we say that it's imminent or occurring. So, you know, there are different kinds of responses that we want the general public to understand. So a tornado watch means that the ingredients are there. It may not be happening right now, but pay attention. We're gonna be looking at radar. We're gonna be um, looking at our models to make sure that we can keep people safe. And in 2011, it was an extraordinary year. We had um, over 1,700 tornadoes that were verified in the United States. Now, the United States has the most tornadoes than anywhere else in the world. Um, and we average around 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 tornadoes each year. So 1,700 was very extreme. Um, and on average, the fatalities that happen from our 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 tornadoes, unfortunately, is still too high. We have about 60 fatalities every year on average from tornadoes. But during 2011, we had over 500 fatalities. And so it's really important to understand the ingredients that come together, where these things happen, who might be at risk, looking at vulnerability, looking at resilience. And that's, that's how we think as geographers. And so I'm going to invite you to become a geographer and think in those ways um, as we're looking at the situations that we deal with in Arizona. So one of the things that we need to understand is the water supply and where we get our water and, and how we utilize our water. And so when we're looking at the water supply in Arizona, it really happens within two rainy seasons, which seems odd when I talk about rainy seasons for a desert, but we absolutely have two times of the year when we tend to have more precipitation, winter precipitation and summer precipitation. So if you were here this summer, you experienced our summer precipitation timeframe, um, where we have precipitation coming in for our monsoon season. The types of systems that happen in the summer are called convective thunderstorms. Convection means warm air rising. So we get those really tall cumulonimbus clouds, heavy, intense precipitation. Um, and then we can also have other conditions such as lightning and hail um, and then flash flooding as a consequence. So that can all happen in our summer precipitation timeframe. And this summer was exceptional. Um, if you may remember last summer, 2020, it was very, very dry. We didn't have the normal amounts of precipitation, about three inches or so we get in the summer. And then this summer we had excessive amounts of precipitation. And that is the nature of what happens with our precipitation in a desert. It's highly variable. So we're looking at these things and we take, you know, we take note and we monitor and we record all of the numbers. And then we look at those trends. So summer precipitation um, tends to come from thunderstorms. The, and the precipitation is not usually enough to recharge our aquifers or fill up our reservoirs. It was this past summer, it was amazing to see, but typically in summer, we just use that precipitation that's more used to kind of moderate what's happening with soil moisture so that our vegetation doesn't desiccate. Um, it doesn't really build into our water supply that we would consider being used in municipalities, for example. Our winter precipitation is where that happens. So our winter precipitation, where we're gonna get snowpacks, um, that's, that's what we're looking for. That's what we want. We wanna have those snowpacks in the higher elevations so that that snow will slowly and gradually recharge our aquifers. Because believe it or not, in Arizona, the majority of our water comes from our aquifers. And so we look at those kinds of considerations. Um, we look at, our basins the, that we're in for our, for our channels. So for example, Colorado River, where does the water come for the Colorado River? And it comes from the upper basin of the Colorado River, so Wyoming and Colorado, and we want them to get snowpack. And so that will melt slowly and allow that water to move into the Colorado River. So when we're looking at, you know, and extrapolating 
for scale and looking at the Western United States, snowpack is the main water supply that we're most concerned about. Um, and so that's where we can have that water slowly move into our, our channels, our rivers, and then into our reservoirs. Um, and so that surface water becomes important and that comes from snowpack as well. So those are all really interesting kinds of, of things to understand about where we get our water. And then looking at trends. So this is how climatologists think. This is what we look at when we're trying to understand um, are, are we getting more precipitation, less precipitation? Where do we land in that? And you may have uh, heard about this. This came out earlier this year where the, the state and the, the country were able to recalculate our numbers, our trends, because we've been keeping observations. So temperature and precipitation observations over most of Arizona for about the last 100 years or so. For most of the United States, a little bit longer, um, depending. Um, but we were able to go back then. And what we do is we, we calculate what are called normals. Normals um, refer to a term, a statistical term that we think about in climatology. It's a 30 year average of precipitation and temperature. So these are the normals that we're looking at for 30 years. And these maps are showing us changes that have happened within the last 30 year calculations. So you can see um, we're looking at calculations from 1991 to 2020. So we look at those 30 years and we'll add everything together and divide to come up with the statistical amounts. And we're comparing it to what we did previously, to the previous normals. So 1981 to 2010, have we changed when we're looking at, at data in that way? And absolutely, you can see that that has, has happened across the United States and Arizona. So what we're looking at here is that with this first map, we're looking at changes in the, the temperature across the country, but also across the United States. And you can see that our temperatures just within the last 30 years have increased um, about half a degree or so Fahrenheit. Um, and then we can look at our precipitation and you can see that our precipitation, according to those, when we're comparing 30 years to 30 years, these last 30 years have decreased. And these last 30 years have been the arena of our most recent drought. And so that kind of aligns with what we would expect. We've been in this drought in Arizona since the mid 1990s. And so I'll talk about those kinds of things as well. So then these are other ways that we look at our, our data. Um, and these data are available readily for everyone, but understanding the data can be challenging. So I'm always happy to explain if you need to pull something up, um, you can contact me, I'm happy to do so. So what we're looking at here is just for Arizona. So we're zooming in to look at just what the temperature has been in Arizona. And we're looking at it over about the last 100 years or so. And so we can go back in time. Our period of record actually is 1895. Um, and then, you know, relying on what's been happening in that period of record. And you can see that our average temperature here is around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, understanding what that means can be challenging because thinking like a climatologist, thinking like a geographer, that number, that one number represents the entire state. So we know that there's a lot of variation with our climate patterns across the entire state. So we have very high elevations. Uh, you go to Flagstaff, that's 7,000 feet elevation. You can go to the White Mountains and the Muggy on Rim, and you're gonna have cooler temperatures than you will down here where we're at about 1,000 feet elevation. The lower you get in, in elevation, the warmer it gets. So the higher you get, the colder it gets. So we have to come together and pull together all of those numbers um, to come up with that one number that represents what's happening. And it's not just over a, a month, it's over the entire year. So we come together statistically. So it's important when we're looking at statistical evaluations of climate to compare the same kinds of values. 
because it's really easy to pull something out. And if you were to look at the same, oh, the temperature on average in Arizona is 60 degrees, I'll move to Arizona. And that's not the case. So it becomes a matter of understanding how these, how these data are calculated. And so when we're looking at the average temperature over the entire year, over the entire state, it's around 60 degrees. And then if we compare that same value year to year to year, that's when we can see that there's been an increase that's been happening year to year to year when we compare that same value. And so you can absolutely see that that average temperature over the entire state over the entire year has gradually and slowly increased. And we're looking at an increase of about two degrees Fahrenheit over the last 100 years. That's absolutely been the case and that's what the data are saying. So it's important to understand where the data come from and how to interpret them. And then here's our precipitation. So take a look at this. You're looking at the same kind of um, period of record. So we're going back, you're looking at 1895, you're looking at the same kind of data where we're looking at the average precipitation for the entire state for the entire year. And so when you're looking at this, it's harder to see a trend, right? So we're looking at things that go up and then go down and go up and go down. And that's what's important to understand about what happens with precipitation in Arizona and in deserts is that our precipitation is highly variable. We're not seeing a trend in more or less precipitation for the state. We do see that we have periods of time where we have more precipitation. Absolutely, you can see that happened here in the early 1900s. And then you can see that we have periods where we don't have as much precipitation. And then when we're trying to identify if we're in a drought, that's one of the more harder kinds of, of things to assess because it takes time to see if we're, if we're on a downward trend of precipitation. And so you can see in the 50s, we did have a drought in this area. And you can see now we're dealing with lower amounts of precipitation and considered to be in a drought at this time since the 1990s. So it's important to, to kind of take a second and see what you're seeing. Um, but it's really interesting to kind of compare those numbers. And now what we do as well is we look at, okay, what do we think is gonna happen? Um, we, can, we can look at our forecast from meteorology. Meteorology is in charge of forecasting what's happening right now to about 14 days or so out, not much longer than that. And usually it's about 10 days that meteorologists will use their forecasting models to see what's gonna happen. And then we look at larger outlooks, and this is where climatology comes in, trying to see trends, trying to understand what's happening you know, at a larger scale, so zooming out. When we look at you know, what's controlling our temperature and our precipitation in Arizona, it's not just what's happening here in Arizona, it's what's happening over the basins, um, looking at these larger trends that are happening globally. So figuring out how that moves into understanding what can happen with our temperatures and precipitation over the next few months. Um, and so we, we look at three month outlooks and what you're looking at here is kind of looking at, so we look at where it's valid, December, January, February, that's, that's our winter. And for us, what we're interested in is getting that winter precipitation in the form of snow. We wanna have a, a good snowpack. And so when our temperatures are forecast to be a little bit warmer than normal, and that's what you're looking at here, the expectation, the statistical outcome is that we will have a little bit warmer temperatures in our winter then you know that's what we want to understand you know and there are you know situations where you have um, that might be beneficial to have warmer temperatures you won't have to turn the heater on at night for example because it'll be warm but then consequences to our climate system that's what we want to understand you know is that going to cause snow to melt and so that's what we look at and that's how we think about these things and so then we look at precipitation because the winter precipitation pattern is our main water supply, not only for Arizona, but for the Western United States. So are we gonna get more precipitation is the expectation there. And again, these are statistical outcomes. They are not by any means a guarantee. Um, and you experience that as well when you look at your forecast for today's high temperature 
and it's close, but it may not be exact. Um, that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, it's, it's when we're looking climatologically, there's there's more uncertainty with the outcomes, but the trends, the statistics in general, the probabilities. That's what we. That's how we think as climatologists. And so we're looking at that um, during our winter precipitation, we're not expecting much precipitation to happen in Arizona. And you can see it smooths along there. The Southern tier is all within that, that forecast, that outlook of where we um, don't expect much precipitation during the winter. So that's something to pay attention to when we're trying to manage water supplies. And so we look at things like this, um, so there are a lot of models that operate at various different scales. So zooming in at spatial scales, so zooming in at what's happening in Arizona, zooming out what's happening here in the Western United States or what's happening in the globe, and um, then trying to understand what's happening over time temporally. So we look at what's called a water year when we're managing our water supply. A water year is um, looking at the starting point of getting that snowpack. So our water year starts October 1st and happens for the entire country. It's not just Arizona. That's how we think about our water supply. And so our water year is another way to keep track of, are we gonna get uh, enough water for that year? And so it runs October through September. And um, we're looking here at normal precipitation. So that's referring to that 30 year average term as well. And so when we look at Arizona and we look at what we expect to happen for this water year, it looks like we may get, you know, about close to average precipitation in the higher elevations. But when we're looking at most of the state, we're expecting to have lower amounts of water for our water year. So low levels of precipitation. So that just continues and builds on. And the reason why we have this is you may have heard in the news that um, we now are experiencing what is called a La Nina advisory. So I'll explain what that happens to be. These are related to and caused by changes to the sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific. So we're looking at global scale teleconnections, things that are influencing the storm tracks, where the storms are gonna go. Because what they ultimately do is they change those global winds. So when we talk about westerly winds or trade winds, those are the, the general wind regimes that happen across the globe. And those are the, the steering mechanisms for our storms. And so when we're looking at changes to sea surface temperatures in a basin, in this basin specifically, the equatorial Pacific, and you can kind of see that here, kind of see it right in between. We have a, a whole series of buoys that are installed in the equatorial Pacific, just measuring that temperature at the sea surface. And so when we're seeing warmer than normal sea surface temperatures, we call that an El Nino. When we see colder than normal sea surface temperatures, we call that a La Nina. And that's what has been measured and observed. And that's now the advisory that we're in is we're looking at La Nina conditions. And so you can kind of see that here when we're looking at anomalies and an anomaly is a departure from the norm. And you can see that we've got colder than normal temperatures in the equatorial Pacific. So going all the way through from South America over to Indonesia. And, and what that does is it changes our storm tracks. And so the La Nina, the La Nina advisory that we're in, it's this one that has the big blue line. Um, what that tends to do is it tends to steer the storms a little bit north. So the northern tier tends to get precipitation and it tends to be colder. So they tend to get more snow. So it's colder and, and more precipitation. So in the northern tier, so, you know, the Pacific Northwest, and you can see some of the states. So we've got Minnesota up in there. Um, you can see that those locations tend to be statistically, it's not a forecast, it just tends to be statistically colder and wetter. And so that means down here in the southern tier where we are, where we're concerned about getting our snowpack, uh, it tends to be drier and it can actually be a little bit warmer. So um, that is the expectation for our precipitation happening this winter. And that's also what happened last winter. And so we dropped out of 
of our water supply um, this last winter, so last year, um, and that started causing more issues with our drought that we'll talk about in just a second. All right, so now let's look at some of these impacts. Um, we can experience heat waves in Arizona, which a lot of folks might seem unusual when we're talking about heat in Arizona where it's hot already. So what we do is we look at things statistically, we try and understand is how much hotter is this than normal. And we also look at when these heat conditions are prevalent. Did we just move from, you know, 80 degree temperatures, and then on a weekend, we're expecting to have 100 degree temperatures. It takes a couple of weeks for a body to acclimatize to that change in temperature param parameter. And so when we have folks that are outside, um, or more often, folks that are used to kind of living in air conditioning, and um, they want to go hike in the in the weekend, and all of a sudden we're expecting to have a temperature that's 20 more degrees than, than what they've been used to, then that can cause problems to their bodies. And so we, we do pay attention to those kinds of things. And that's kind of how we look at our measure of heat in Arizona. And that's how we would align to having a heat wave watch or warning. Um, so if we're gonna have more extreme temperatures or if we're expecting temperatures to make a quick jump, that's absolutely what we want to understand. And so you can see that spring and fall, as we're transitioning, those are our transition seasons, as we're moving from kind of cooler temperatures to warmer temperatures, we have that big jump quickly, and then that can cause harm to, to people that are outside, people at risk, people that might be vulnerable. Um, we, we identify a heat wave as when we have two days or more of excessive heat. And the reason why we say that is because you're most bodies can tolerate um, excessive heat in one day, but you have to cool off the body overnight. And if you don't have that ability to do so, and that's where you get two days of excessive heat, that's when people, even healthy young people, are susceptible to these heat kinds of events. And so, you know, one way to look at that is to understand the heat index and to, to look at how it played out in Chicago during that the 1995 heat wave. Um, and so what we also consider and what we want to understand is not just the hot temperatures, that's important, but we also want to understand is there moisture in the atmosphere? Is there um, a high relative humidity? That's one way to assess how much moisture is in the atmosphere. And, and you probably have heard that Arizona is a dry heat, and that's because we tend to not have a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, very low relative humidities. And what that means is that when it's hot outside, your body can evaporatively cool more readily if it's dry because you'll sweat and the sweat can evaporate off of your skin and evaporation is a cooling process. And so that, that's a very effective way for your body to cool. However, if you have higher relative humidities, then that will not allow as much evaporation. And so it'll feel worse, your body won't be able to effectively cool. And you may have experienced this if you go back in the Southeast. So you can go to Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and you feel how muggy it is in the summer. That's the distinction. And so it's an, it's an, an important aspect of understanding how heat can relate to issues of health. And then we look at what's in our atmosphere. So um, atmosphere constituents. So we look at, you know, we're a nitrogen based atmosphere. It's what we're sucking in 78% of what we breathe in with oxygen in the atmosphere. But then the atmosphere also has various different materials in. And so um, even though we look at 99% of the, the volume of the atmosphere being nitrogen and oxygen, then we look at a lesser amount being um, various different constituents such as ozone. Um, we look at our greenhouse gases, um, and then we look at particulate matter. So particulate matter is, is materials, solids, that are held in suspension in the atmosphere. And you may have seen those. If you look through your window and you see the sun shining through your window and you can see little fluffy things floating around, those would be considered particulates. And so those are held in suspension in our atmosphere and we can breathe those in 
depending upon the size of those particulates. So ozone is a good thing in our atmosphere when it's in the stratosphere. So when it's high up in the stratosphere, ozone is actually beneficial. And ozone has led us to our modern atmosphere. The buildup of ozone a few million years ago um, blocks incoming UVB and UVC radiation and actually protects some of those you know, it, it blocks some of those dangerous forms of radiation from getting down to us. And so ozone in the stratosphere is good, but we can actually produce ozone down here at the surface. And ozone is O3. So it's, um, when we look at oxygen in the atmosphere, oxygen is diatomic, it's O2. That's what we're all breathing in because that's the stable form of oxygen. Um, and so when we have um, an unstable, singular oxygen molecule, it wants to join up and find a friend. And that absolutely happens when we are down here at the surface, providing kind of the ingredients that will build ozone. So the ingredients that kind of allow it to bake together, if you will. And one of those is sunlight. So having clear skies, um, that, will, that will actually break apart ozone. It's called uh, photo disassociation, and it'll break apart oxygen molecules. And so it will create unstable O molecules down here at the surface looking for their friend. So that's one of the, the reasons why we're susceptible here in Arizona in the summer to ozone production. Other things that facilitate that motion and, and bringing the O3 together um, would be um, volatile organic compounds, things like come out of our gas um, and nitrogen oxides, those kinds of things. And so when we have um, a higher incidence of those at the surface combined with our summer, clear summer, summer skies, then the ozone production can increase. And you may have heard that we'll put out ozone warnings. Um, and the idea is for folks to not fuel their gas tanks during the afternoon when the sun is the highest in the sky and maybe to carpool to try and prevent some of that ozone production. Um, ozone is a respiratory irritant here at the surface. And so folks that are susceptible like asthma, older folks, um, they are susceptible to these more kinds of respiratory issues. I like what the Arizona Lung Association describes it. It describes ozone as you know, sunburn on the lungs, which is interesting to consider that. Um, with ozone, the impacts would be like coughing, scratchy throat, those kinds of things, but also more susceptible to asthma if you're already dealing with asthma. So that's a summer situ situation largely. And then we'll look at the particulate matter. So particulate matter, what that is, those are solids that are held in suspension in the atmosphere. And um, those then are sized, and we measure these things. The, the EPA wants us to quantify and not exceed certain thresholds of particulate matter. The sizes that we're interested in are measured in microns. Microns are a millionth of a meter, so it's very, very small, um, but it's a way to measure how big these are. And so when we're looking at um, um, particulate matter that's 10 microns, PM10 is what we call that, um, that's a very small size, and it's typically the size of materials that we get from our dust storms. So dust is typically the PM10 size, and we don't want people breathing that in. Um, that can get lodged in your lungs. The smoke, the, the 2.5 PM, those are the, the kinds of things that you would see with a fire. You know, you put a fire in your fireplace or you have a... Um, an outdoor barbecue and you see the soot kind of moving into the atmosphere and that would be considered smoke. Both sizes of those particulates can be lodged in the lung. And so we, we would put out considerations, warnings about um, uh, PM warnings. So PM 10 to PM 2.5. And um, these things will happen at different times of the year depending on what's going on. I do wanna kind of introduce how we get our dust storms. And those are typically associated with our summer precipitation patterns. So with our summer precipitation, we get our convective thunderstorms, warm air rising, cold air comes down. And that cold air can come down and spread out in front of the storm. And that's how we get our dust storms in the summer quite a bit. 
Um, and so understanding that process, we can kind of look ahead if we're expecting a lot of thunderstorm activity, we can actually on radar see where those that cold air is coming down to the surface, we can see how it's, it's moving and progressing forward. And then as it moves across our desert um, and places that have loose soils, then that's that it's called a gas front that can pick up and push forward all of that dust. And so you may have heard that called a haboob. A haboob is a dust storm that's formed by our, our thunderstorms that we get in the summer. So it's the dust storm that's generated from those thunderstorms. And obviously we don't want folks breathing in these particulates. So we try and let folks know ahead of time um, get inside, you absolutely don't want to be out and breathing that dust. The other thing that happens when we're moving dust along the surface is it can bring spores into the atmosphere that are held in, in a suspension that people can then breathe in. And that's where we can get incidences of valley fever. So valley fever is um, the spores, the fungus that's embedded in our soils being lofted and then breathed in. So we absolutely want to um, pay attention to those kinds of outcomes. These both are largely summer issues because those are largely associated with our, our summer activity of our dust storms. So absolutely paying attention to what can happen as a consequence becomes important. And then in the winter time, we have a, a different kind of situation that's set up. So if you've heard of the brown cloud, this is what we're talking about here. So these are um, inversions that happen in the wintertime and they're already starting to pick up. The ground can cool off much faster than the air above it. And so when we have that happen in the wintertime, our ground gets nice and cold, it cools off, it cools off, it cools off. The air above it doesn't cool as quickly. And so what that tends to do then is it, it traps all of the, the cold air down here at the surface. And so if we have folks that you know, wanna have a fire because it's cold and they'll burn a fire in their fireplace, all of that soot is then put into the atmosphere and trapped closer to us. Um, and so um, that becomes a problem when we're increasing the PM25 in the atmosphere from our inversions. And so here's what our brown cloud looks like. And I'm sure you've all seen it, um, but this is largely a winter situation because we're cooling the ground, cooling it down colder than the air above it. And so it's kind of trapping all of those particulates and we'll want to put out you know, warnings saying, you know, we're expecting to have um, a lot of particulate matter being trapped. So please don't burn. Um, and we call these no burn days. So those absolutely happen. And of course, you can go um, at the state and the county level, you can get information about air quality. So the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality has information on a daily basis. They have a, a series of meteorologists that forecast the likelihood for, for dust and for ozone. Um, and I would encourage you to, to take a look at their resources. It's really quite interesting, but they will definitely put out the expectations for particulate matter and for ozone because of this, those are the two main situations that we, we have here when we're looking at air quality in Arizona. And then we'll move into drought. So drought, there are four main different types of drought, if you will. It, it's a challenging thing to understand, but it's, it's about trying to determine, you know, where are we getting our water and what's happening to that water. So when you look at the four different types of drought here, the meteorological drought means that we're not getting as much rain or snow as we normally do. So we can look at our observations and say, okay, we're in meteorological drought, we're not getting as much. And then you go to hydrologic drought and hydrological drought is looking at water in our, our channels and looking at what's happening um, in the Colorado River, for example, in the Salt River and the Verde River. So we're looking hydrologically at what, how much water we have in those locations and trying to assess where, we, where we're at. Hydrologic drought is, um, much harder to move away from. Um, it's more 
um, specific and um, entrenched, then we, we can look and you can see that. <laughs> And you can see that um, only a very small portion of our state is now in extreme drought, so not even exceptional. So we've improved, um, but there are some places that are so entrenched in drought that it's harder for them to move out. And so right now we're about 9% in extreme drought and about 68% in the moderate and severe measures of drought. Where you see the bright yellow, the abnormally dry, that's not even considered drought. So that's a great thing. And you can see the abnormally dry. As a geographer, what do we see? We see that this is right along the Mugion Rim and in through to the White Mountains. And you're gonna tend to get a lot of precipitation there as well. Um, Pima County, had a tremendous amount of precipitation as well. So a lot of places were able to move away from some of those extreme kinds of situations. Thank you, Dr. Sapple. That was a great presentation. Um, it looks like we hit on all the questions in the chat box. So thank you again for taking time to answer all those. And um, thanks again. All right, everyone have a great day. Enjoy, bye-bye.